Hi, Dr. Fred Southwick, Professor of Medicine here, and this is our second video talking about anti-infective, anti-infective therapy. In our first video, we discussed the personal consequences of infections due to antibiotic-resistant pathogens and how antibiotics are mismanaged. Now I would like to teach you how to most effectively prescribe antibiotics. In order to effectively prescribe antibiotics, it is critical to roughly know the antibacterial spectrums of the agents you are using. This is difficult, if not impossible, to memorize. Therefore, I strongly recommend that you use the table published in Infectious Diseases, a clinical short course, and available on our course website. There are two versions you can download. One that includes only the antibiotics you will need to know for testing as a preclinical medical student, and a second comprehensive table that you can use when you are working on the wards. To better understand antibiotic coverage, the analogy of a ladder can be used. The higher on the ladder, the more advanced the antibiotic, and often the more expensive. Let's first look at the penicillin ladder. Penicillin G was the first penicillin to be discovered, and today this antibiotic is primarily used to treat syphilis. It also effectively covers streptococci and anaerobic mouth flora. Because Staph aureus quickly became resistant to penicillin, nafcillin and oxacillin were developed. These agents cannot be broken down by Staph's beta-lactamase, and they effectively treat methicillin-sensitive Staph, abbreviated MSSA. Next, ampicillin and its oral alternative amoxicillin were created, and this aminopenicillin not only covers the same gram-positives as penicillin, but also kills some gram-negative bacteria covering a relatively small percentage of E. coli, Proteus, and Klebsiella. To broaden its coverage, the beta-lactamase inhibitor Sulbactam was added to ampicillin and clavulinate to, to amoxicillin. This addition has increased the percentage of susceptible E. coli, Proteus, and Klebsiella and rendered these agents effective against MSSA. With the increased use of oxacillin came methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, or MRSA. Although methicillin is no longer given to patients, by convention, this is the antibiotic dish used to test for methicillin-sensitive MSSA and methicillin-resistant MRSA, Staph aureus. The treatment of choice for most cases of MRSA is vancomycin. With the increased use of vancomycin, vancomycin-resistant enterococcus, VRE, increased in prevalence, spurring the development of linazolid, a very expensive IV and oral antibiotic that covers VRE and MRSA. On the gram-negative side, next the uretopenicillin piperacillin was discovered that kills Pseudomonas, in addition to the gram negatives covered by ampicillin sulbactam. To enhance coverage, this penicillin has been combined with another beta-lactamase inhibitor, tazobactam. This combination has the commercial name Zosin and is one of the most popular very broad-spectrum antibiotics because in addition to enhanced gram negative coverage, it also kills MSSA and anaerobes. Finally, with the increased use of piperacillin tazobactam and cephalosporins, there has been a rise in extended spectrum beta lactamases, ESBLs, produced by E. coli and Klebsiella and requiring treatment with carbapenems, beta lactam antibiotics whose beta lactam ring cannot be broken down by ESBLs. These agents are generally reserved for severe hospital-acquired infections. Here are the antibiograms for all of these antibiotics. On the top horizontal row is a list of all the bacterial pathogens 
beginning with anaerobes, followed by gram-positive bacteria, and then gram-negative bacteria. The vertical axis lists the different antibiotics beginning with the penicillins. A black square indicates that a pathogen on the horizontal row is sensitive 61 to 95% of the time to the antibiotic listed in the vertical row. The darker gray denotes 30 to 60% sensitivity, the light gray less than 30% sensitivity. An open space indicates the antibiotic is not effective against the pathogen. You see only a few black squares in the top antibiotic row for penicillin, indicating it is a narrow spectrum antibiotic, while piperacillin tazobactam and the carbipenems, imipenem, doripenem, and meropenem have many black squares, indicating they kill a very broad spectrum of bacteria. Now let's look at the cephalosporin ladder. As we discussed earlier, whenever possible, cephalosporins should be prescribed because they are the safest class of antibiotics, being associated with the lowest number of adverse reactions. The first cephalosporin developed was cefazolin, trade name Ansef. This agent covers MSSA, streptococci, and a modern number of E. coli, proteus, and Klebsiella. The oral preparation, Keflex, is well absorbed. As we discussed later, these first-generation cephalosporins are the treatment of choice for many soft tissue infections. The second generation of cephalosporins are now rarely used because the only addition to their bacterial spectrum was ana anaerobic bacteria. Cefoxidin is recommended for treatment of pelvic inflammatory disease. The third-generation cephalosporins, specifically ceftriaxone, with its once per day dosing is now the workhorse antibiotic rec recommended for the treatment of all four of the most common anatomic infections, pneumonia, meningitis, cellulitis, and pyelonephritis. Third generation cephalosporins have enhanced gram negative coverage and cover streptococci as well. As compared to first generation cephalosporins, their ability to kill MSSA is less effective. Therefore, in documented MSSA infections, they are not recommended. Ceftazidine has reduced gram-positive efficacy, but is the only third-generation cephalosporin capable of killing Pseudomonas. Cefepime, the only fourth-generation cephalosporin on the market, has excellent Pseudomonas coverage and also has excellent gram-positive coverage that is comparable to cefazolin. This very broad spectrum antibiotic is commonly used in hospital acquired infections. There is a fifth generation cephalosporin, cefeteroline, that adds MRSA coverage, but otherwise is comparable in coverage to ceftriaxone. It is rarely prescribed. Here is the antibiogram for the cephalosporins. As you can see, cefazolin at the top of this chart is a narrow spectrum antibiotic that is safe and inexpensive. And when possible, this antibiotic should be prescribed. Near the bottom is cefepime, showing many dark squares reflecting its very broad spectrum of activity. I recommend a brief pause and a review before continuing this video. In the next section, I will describe how the information I have just relayed can be applied to treating patients. Now let's review the antibiotic recommendations for the treatment of infections at four specific sites. Together, these anatomic sites represent the bulk of bacterial infections. These recommendations will need to be memorized and will be included on your board exams. They are based on the Infectious Disease Society of America guidelines, IDSA guidelines, and the First Aid USMLE 1 and 2 review books. First, pneumonia. There are two forms, community-acquired pneumonia, abbreviated CAP. And in patients that do not require hospitalization, the macrolide antibiotic azithromycin is recommended. For patients requiring hospitalization, 
ceftriaxone, and azithromycin is preferred. But the fluoroquinolone, levofloxacin, that has both gram-positive and gram-negative coverage can also be used. For hospital-acquired pneumonia, abbreviated HAP, H-A-P, very broad-spectrum coverage is recommended. Cefepime can be used. Other possible treatments include a carbapenem with pseudomonas coverage or piperacillin tazobactam. If there is a worsening on this coverage, vancomycin can be added to cover for MRSA. Second, meningitis. Treat with high doses of ceftriaxone, 2 grams daily, and vancomycin, and initiate steroids before or at the time antibiotics are started. In patients 60 years of age or older, or patients who are immunocompromised, ampicillin should be added. Third is cellulitis. For mild cellulitis, PO Keflex, penicillin VK, dicloxacillin, or clindamycin can be used. For moderately severe cellulitis, IV cephalozolin is effective. You can also use ceftriaxone, penicillin, or clindamycin. Oxacillin and nafcillin is no longer recommended. If the infection does not improve, you can switch to vancomycin. If the patient is on an oral regimen, you can try trimethylene sulfamethoxazole before initiating IV vancomycin. And finally, for urinary tract infections in patients with cystitis, trimethylene sulfamethoxazole, nitrofurantoin, or amoxicillin clavulinate are preferred. Some physicians continue to use a short course of fluoroquin- the fluoroquinolone ciprofloxacin. Ciprofloxacin is predom- predominantly covers gram-negative rods, including pseudomonas, which are the primary causes of most urinary tract infections. However, ciprofloxacin now has a black box warning because of the risk of cartilage damage and alterations in mental status. For a pregnant female, nitrofurin, amoxicillin, or an oral cephalosporin is recommended. Fluoroquinolones, trimethylene sulfa, and doxycycline should be avoided. For pyelonephritis, ciprofloxacin PO is preferred. However, if there is nausea and vomiting, making oral ingestion of antibiotics difficult, IV ceftriaxone is recommended. Or if the patient is severely ill, cefepime or a carbapenem with anisodomonas spectrum should be ordered to cover for pseudomonas. I know this is a lot to memorize, and I'm hoping these drawings will make it a little easier for you to remember these regimens. Now let's look at the overall strategy used by infectious disease experts to prescribe antibiotics. Step one, decide whether the patient has a bacterial versus a viral infection. Clinical clues may be helpful. Patients with an elevated peripheral white count, elevated procalcitonin, and elevated CRP are more likely to have a bacterial infection. Also, purulent exudate in the sputum, predominance of neutrophils in the CSF, and significant pyuria, pyuria point to a bacterial infection. Step two, if bacterial infection is suspected, determine the likely anatomic site of the infection and apply the empiric regimens I just discussed. Step three, in choosing the antibiotic regimen, it is important to take into account the flora in your hospital and unit. The antibiogram I shared reflects the national averages and may differ in your community and hospital. Step four, Take into account recent treatment with antibiotics. If a patient has received an antibiotic within the last two to four weeks, assume the present infection is resistant to the antibiotic that was previously prescribed. Step five, take into account specific host factors, age, immune static, status, hepatic and renal function, duration of hospitalization, and most important, the severity of illness. More severely ill patients warrant coverage with broader spectrum antibiotics. Step six, at three days, 
streamline your antibiotic regimen based on culture results and the clinical response. And finally, step seven, pick the narrow spectrum, most cost-effective, least toxic regimen. I recommend using this seven-point checklist that can be downloaded from the website. Be sure to obey the three-day rule. Continuing broad-spectrum antibiotics beyond three days drastically alters the host's normal flora, selecting for resistant pathogens, including C. difficile. After three days, streamline your antibiotics by choosing the narrow spectrum possible based on your bacterial cultures and sensitivities. Finally, a word about colonization. As described in the three-day rule, under the selection pressures of antibiotics, non-sterile sites in the body will grow resistant bacteria and, will be, and these bacteria will become the new resident organisms in the host. Often these bacteria will not become invasive, but simply colonize. Antibiotics should be switched only if there is evidence for a new infection, fever, leukocytosis, new exudate, new symptoms. Don't change your antibiotic based on the culture alone. We've covered a lot of ground today. Let me summarize my presentation. First, we discussed antibiotic ladders that can be used to order antibiotics by breadth of gram-positive and gram-negative spectrum of activity, and we focused on penicillins and the cephalosporins. Next, I reviewed the empiric regimens for the four most common infections, pneumonia, meningitis, cellulitis, and urinary tract infections. Finally, we described the seven-step strategy for prescribing antibiotics, emphasizing the importance of obeying the three-day rule and of differentiating colonization from a new infection. By applying what you have learned today, you can help to prevent the development of antibiotic-resistant pathogens, save lives, and prevent the end of the antibiotic era. Thank you.